Um, I have the honor of, of introducing Dr. Constance Yekonyo, who is uh, my fellow Kenyan, an advocate and a lecturer by profession. Uh, she's a senior lecturer um, at, at the University of Nairobi and the School of Law. Um, her research interests are in the areas of maritime law, anti-money laundering, asset forfeiture, and the connection between money laundering and aspects of transnational organized crime. Uh, in fact, I remember um, the last um, one of the last uh, webinars for GSDEC, uh, she did speak about this topic, about the unintended consequences of, of, of anti -money, the global anti-money laundering uh, regulations. Um, she also look, looks at the areas of uh, blue economy and fisheries and research methodology. Um, she has conducted trainings on the areas of AML, asset forfeiture, for various organizations, including the LSK, the Wyam of Foundation, state legal departments, and in countries such as Rwanda, Zambia, Uganda, Tanzania, and Mozambique. Uh, she has also authored publications in her areas of research interests. Uh, today, um, Const Connie is going to be um, uh, just uh, briefing us about the ambiguities of the global standards um, with respect to Africa. And uh, without further ado, um, Connie, uh, please take the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Masi, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm saying good afternoon because here it's in the afternoon. And thank you very much for the warm welcome and for the invitation to be part of this uh, discussion. So um, to begin our discussion, I build on what has already been said by the two speakers who have gone ahead of me. Actually, as they were speaking, I was saying, tick, I, that is, I, is uh, very much true in terms of what um, has happened. Now, before I proceed, am I the one sharing the slides or are they going to be shared from that end? I will ask the team to share uh, this with, uh, for you now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. So um, I build up on what the other two uh, speakers have already said, and it is to highlight what in my own reading, and uh, analysis, I come to realize are some of the ambiguities or issues that the FATF has not really considered in seeking to implement um, the FATF standards in uh, developing countries. Now, this has led to a situation where we are saying Africa has a problem with implementation. And my answer is this, definitely Africa will have a problem with implementation if we do not properly consider the facts on the ground, the reality on the ground in enough of these African uh, countries so that we tailor make the FATF regime suitable and applicable in these uh, jurisdictions. So I will look at this in terms of uh, four subheadings. And this will be in terms of one, looking at the history, how was, how were these standards implement, uh, brought into Africa? Then after that, uh, that is the next slide, please. Then after that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Connie. Can I just interrupt and request whoever's um, um, projecting your slides to do so in slide mode, please, so that we can see them clearly? All right, thank you. Please go ahead, please do go yes. ahead, okay. Connie. So we look at it from the historical perspective, we look at the institutional challenges that are present, the cultural, economic, and the implementation challenges that ex exist. So to begin with, the, in terms of the developmental or historical challenges, is what has already been said by Dr. Igbo. The norms that we adopted, are they our norms as Africans? And my reading has uh, made me realize that Indeed, these were not norms that Africa sat at the table or the global South. Actually, it is said that they developed from America. The assumption generally is that they began at some Paris meeting of the G7. But in actual fact, who pushed the norms during the G7 uh, meetings? It was America, which already had implemented these policies in its country to deal with the crime of drug trafficking. 
So through the G7, which led to the formation of the FATF, these norms were therefore pushed onto the other African uh, countries. So at this developmental stage, the global South was not in any way involved. And actually the only country that represents uh, us there or rather represents itself is South Africa. No other uh, Af uh, African country or global South uh, country sits uh, on this uh, platform. The other aspect in terms of historical, we need to go back to um, the early eighties in Africa where we had the policies uh, of the World Bank, the structural adjustment programs. Now, these policies were supposed to have a positive effect on Africa, but in actual fact, they ended up in most of the um, instances having a negative effect. So when it came to the adoption of the FATF, most African countries implemented, the, implemented them because of coercion. We had no way, um, we, we could not refuse them because the consequences were there. And the countries that attempted to do so suffered the consequences. So when African countries now look and string along what happened with the SAPs, the structural adjustment programs, and now the implementation of the FATF standards, there is, uh, the, 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 this has led to the perception that, look, this is another form of neocolonialism. We are being forced to implement things that we do not appreciate. And I can say for sure, for example, when I read the parliamentary record from the Kenyan parliament about the implementation of the uh, FATF standards under Kenyan law, you realize they did it at the very end because they had no choice. They had tried, I think twice, to, uh, to have a statute enacting those uh, standards and bringing them into law. And it never worked until the very end where I believe Kenya was pushed between a rock and a hard place and the legislators had no choice but uh, to adopt. So there is that problem of historically. Then along with the historical comes the one size fits all. Since there was no chance to have a discussion with these global South entities, it was implement as is. And this has already been touched on by Dr. Igbe. Now this implement as is, means we do not actually consider what is happening with this jurisdiction and what is suitable so that we can adapt it and make it suitable for uh, the particular uh, jurisdiction. When we come now to the next aspect of, sorry, uh, we should be, I think two slides or three slides ahead. Yes, next slide, please. In, when we come to the institutional perspective, uh, you realize that the FATF standards rely on the use of very many systems for it to work well. For you, for example, to be able to tell who are the ultimate beneficial owners, a system needs to be created for that. The banking system is very crucial to the implementation of FATF standards. That needs to be in order. Yet when you look at Africa, our systems are not in order. Simply even just registration of persons is in chaos, if not even if, if it exists in some uh, places. So that means that when the standards rely on these systems for effect, uh, uh, to ensure effectiveness, there's a problem that cannot happen. For example, in Kenya, it's only last year where companies were supposed to register and indicate the ultimate beneficial owners of uh, a particular corporate entity that has been formed under the Kenyan law. Before that did not exist. So then, there was a gap before, and not to say that right now things are working smoothly. So without these systems, there's a problem. Then comes our judicial system. Plenty of problems, delays in the court process. So that a matter that would probably take, uh, should take two years or three years maximum, you'll find drugs on for 10 years, which therefore means even those who are found guilty of offenses related to money laundering, we forget. So eventually we end up with a situation where we assume crime pays because of these uh, delays. Then the punishment in some situations may actually be inefficient. Sorry, Connie, just to warn you, just to warn okay. you, you have three more minutes. I know you started a little late, but uh, three more minutes, please. Okay, no problem. Yeah. 
So then again, there's the public private boundaries of governance that have been crossed. The FATF standards rely a lot on the private entities for implementation. There's a problem. The private entities, do they have the funds? Do they have the capacity to be able to do this? Next, please. Then we come to cultural. Now here lies a lot. This I believe has been underlooked. For example, in Africa, what is our understanding of corruption? Where family is really put at the forefront, you helping your family members so that whatever you can do to help them, even if it means use uh, public funds, it is considered positive. So that is not in some instances taken to be corruption. Then we move to the perception of what exactly then um, do we understand corruption as? We have now even moved further to a situation where we are moving from communal ownership to individualism. So I need to get rich. And the faster I get rich and accumulate wealth, the better for me. Because it also means that politically, if I want to be recognized, I need to have wealth. And that is what we are having. So are the FATF standards able to deal with this uh, cultural uh, perspectives or have they taken into consideration these cultural perspectives? Next, please. Then after that, economic. Again, here raises very many uh, aspects. The social economic um, uh, perspective of Africa. We are mainly a cash-based society. We rely on uh, alternative means to transfer uh, value, such as um, there is the, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, Hawala, the famous Hawala. So these systems do not operate within the normal banking system. Yet when you look at the FATF standards, they are geared towards the normal financial systems. So why are these standards really equipped to deal with Africa? Next, please. The implementation, cost of implementation is high and burdensome. So that if you expect a private entities to undertake this implementation process, they need to have systems in place. They need to train manpower. Are even our other supervisory bodies that would help, for example, when it comes to designated non-financial uh, businesses and persons, you have the lawyers. Is our law society in Kenya properly equipped to assist lawyers to implement the FATF standards as they will now actually be required, although the matter is in law, but it has been passed into law that lawyers uh, should report under the Kenyan law. Are the regional bodies taking any role in helping to improve the capacity for African uh, uh, countries or other agencies within Africa to assist with implementation. Uh, next, please. I'm, I'm sorry, Connie, I think you just have to wrap up now because yes. we are totally out of time. Okay. Yeah. So uh, please to just wrap up, wrap up your, your last slide. slide. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. So to wrap it all up, I would say that um, there is hope. If, the global south can be called to the table and we look into these issues and we are asked how do we go about this i believe solutions can be found and that way these standards which i believe they're not all wrong it's just a matter of adapting them to the relevant uh, circumstances in the global south thank you very much thank you so much um uh, connie um for for again, that very insightful presentation.